the record, we are interviewing former city councilman, former representative Johnny Jackson Jr. for the Midlow Center on today, June 23rd, 2016. Would you please, please state your full name? Uh, my name is Johnny Jackson Jr. Do you consent to have us to uh, do this interview today? I absolutely do. Good, let's get started. Uh, when and where were you born? I was born uh, September the 19th, 1943, uh, here in New Orleans, Louisiana, at Charity Hospital. So was I. <laughs> so most, most of us. So in what neighborhood did you live? Uh, I've lived in many neighborhoods. Really? Uh, because during that time, uh, uh, I've lived uptown in Gertown, lived Central City, live off of Fountain Blue Drive. Really? Uh, I've, uh, majority of, of my life, I've lived in the Desire, Florida area in the night war. Okay. Where did you go to school first? Same thing. <laughs> I went to a bunch of schools. Really? Okay. I went to Daniel, Savannah Williams. O. Hoffman, New Hoffman, wow. Edgar P. Honig, wow. Carter G. Woodson, Andrew J. Bell, Joseph S. Clark. Hey. <laughs> uh, but I finished, hey, from George Washington Carver. So you were Senior in. high in 1961. And the reason I went to all those schools is because, you know, those were the days of segregation. Right. And we had to go to, uh, we were on platoon systems. And as I moved, my parents moved to live with my aunt or, or somewhere else, you know, I had to change schools. Uh, I went to Bell and Clark at the same time because Bell did not have music and I went to Clark for music. Uh, and then in 1958, uh, they opened a new Carver complex. So when you went to Carver, you were a sophomore or a junior? Yeah, yeah, I wanted to originally, well, not the original, uh, well, three-year original graduating class. Right. I went in 58, but there were a couple of classes uh, that had uh, the class of 59 and the Which class Which was half of, of my class from Clark. Yeah, 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 graduated from Clark. Right. So when we right. have reunions, we invite them because they were at Clark two years and yeah, only yeah. at Clark for one year. Yeah, we just had the graduation of 2016 and they were present, the class of 59, the class of 60. Every year we give what we call a Ram Jam to raise money for the school. Yeah. And uh, we invite all classes from, from 59 uh, to the present. Okay. And uh, we've had occasions uh, where we've had representatives of former alumnus from 59, 60, my class, for example, we celebrating the 55th year right. this year. Right. Uh, but there's been good representation. How many people came to the 55th? Well, I'll know this Friday, but. Oh, okay, uh, so you haven't had it yet? No, no, we were, we're planning to do something okay. uh, uh, in September. I would think that uh, there'll be maybe about, uh, if we get 60, we're good. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that's from a class of 500, 300 during those yeah. days. Carver uh, graduated large number of students. I remember Clover graduation lasting to 1230, 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but we had our 55th reunion two years ago from Clark, and I think we had like 37 yeah. out of a class of 217. Yeah. And each year we're losing some people. Yeah, and, and the fact that a lot of uh, this place, you know, we've lost That's some for, to death, and but a lot is because of Katrina, they're misplaced. Right. They, they, they're at the age now where they're settled. Right. Because you were out of town back. for what, at least five years? No, I was out of town for 11 years. 11? So you just came back? I just came back. Mm -hmm. I, I would, um, I think, for the first four years, I would spend a lot of time trying to restore my home. Yeah. Uh, as most people were doing after Katrina. Uh, then the other five years, I still did that, but 
uh, I had portions of it where I could sleep in and stuff. Yeah. And so I came back to to complete it, but at the same time, uh, be involved with community efforts right. to restore the community. So where did you go to Houston? No, I actually went to Dallas. Oh, you went to Dallas. Okay. Uh, we moved five times: Dallas, Richardson, East Plano, and. Finally, wound up in a, a, a town called McKinney, Texas, yeah. which is 40 miles north of Dallas. Okay. Uh, uh, I mean, it was an experience. Did you like it? I, I tell everyone, uh, yeah, yeah, the quality of life yeah, for my family was, was exceptional. Yeah. Uh, Texas and some of the people that uh, enable us to survive were exceptional, right. uh, but there's no place like home. We were just talking about that. No place like well, home. Well, you know, I had a sister-in-law who lived there, must have been there about 25 years. Mm -hmm. I'd gone, I really hadn't liked very much about Houston. Mm -hmm. They couldn't have been nicer. Yeah. People really went out of their way, and we had an apartment for uh, about three and a half years. Mm -hmm. I came back, I had to come back to right. teach, and the second semester, mm -hmm. but we uh, commuted back and forth. My wife actually got a teaching job. Mm -hmm. My daughter and my only granddaughter moved to outside of Houston. They're still there. In fact, that's my biggest loss to tell people right. because I only have that one grandchild and I used to pick up from, uh, from nursery. She went to school in Houston. They have good schools. Oh yeah. They I, put I, I, an I, emphasis I, on education. Yeah. yeah. They. Uh, and I have uh, still in McKinney, most of my family is back with me. Uh, you know, I chose to build uh, a big house when I was here prior right. to Katrina. Yeah, pass your house all the time. Yeah. And uh, so most, all of them were back except one. And that's my youngest daughter. And she has my grandson with her up there. Her and her husband, he's got two more years to finish high school. Okay. So, uh, you know, we discussed it and told her, no, you know, just let him finish high school and then make a determination right. as to whether or not you're coming back. Yeah, because my, my daughter talks about coming back, so there's nothing here for you. Right. There's so many more opportunities there. Oh, yeah. The quality of life. Uh, and I think that's happening uh, with a lot of black folks who were forced to go through other parts of the country. They found a better standard of life, better quality of life, better opportunities. Yeah. And many have, have chosen not to return. In well, other words, they come back for Essence, Mardi Gras, family still reunions. <laughs> yeah, it's still oh, yeah. big something. Absolutely. Absolutely. I found out once they found out that we were here and they started getting in camellia beans and red yeah. beans and uh, patent hot sausage. Mm -hmm. Could make gumbo like you could make in New Orleans. Yeah. A lot of people, well, you could make it here. Yeah. Plus, the money. I remember I was in uh, uh, a Sunday school class and I was talking about the wages being going up because of Katrina to $8 yeah. an hour. Yeah. And the teacher said, Eight dollars an hour? That ain't no money. Yeah. <laughs> and I found out the postal workers in Houston paid were paid more than they were paid here. Oh, I yeah. thought all the postal workers made the same all over the country. Yeah. I I, I think uh, there are many exceptions. Yeah. You know, and so when one has to decide, I mean, the older guys like us, older ladies, you know, they'll come back. Yeah. But. Uh, People who just starting families yeah. or who had started families right before Katrina, uh, many of them have decided, no, you know, I, I'll, I'll come back. I'll come see mama. I'll see daddy, cousin. Right. I'll come back for the various holidays and family reunions. But, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, if they had to cho choose whether or not they were going to move to Montana, they'd tell you you're out your mind. Right. Or uh, move to Utah or Idaho. Right. Uh, uh, but uh, 
But you I learn that free. people do live differently, but they also live similarly. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. When you were growing up, what kind of work did your parents do? Well, my mother color? has been a lifelong beautician. Okay. So uh, she graduated from Katie School Katie of Beauty. Katie Victor, yeah. And my father uh, did several uh, jobs, as I recall. Uh, he primarily was a cab driver okay. for Logan Cab. Okay. One of the biggest black cab firms during that time. I remember Logan. He, he drove truck for United Parcel. Okay. Uh, then he delivered, because my mother was in the cosmetology uh, setting, he went to work for Stevens, you know. The, yeah, they, did I know Steve? He, yeah. he worked for Emmett Douglas too, didn't yeah. he? Yeah, Stevens and Emmett Douglas, that's yeah. right. And they used to deliver products throughout the state and throughout Mississippi Gulf Coast. Right. And he did that for a while, you know. Uh, so, but that's that's basically what what they did. Were they involved in any community activities that kind of stimulated? My to mother them? was was not. My mom was heavy into church, okay. you know. But my dad was, you know. He uh, he served on the 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 local uh, community organization association. Yeah. Uh, he was with the Kiwanis. Uh, when I got elected back in 72 to the House of Representatives, uh, I submitted his name to the governor uh, for the pardon board, and so he yeah. was accepted, and he served on the pardon board during the first term of Edwin Edwards. Uh, he was a part of the Democratic Central Committee that was his politics. And uh, he been he went to a couple of the national conventions. National conventions. Uh, in fact, I think he was wasn't he a Carter delegate? Yeah, I thought I in remember fact, that. In fact, in um, fact, when I uh, was asked to run for the House of Representatives right after the reapportionment of 1970, uh, 71. 71. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, I thought they were asking my father to run, you right. know, because I, I was involved in the community, running the desired community center. Uh, but as a result of that real portion, man, uh, they, uh, people like Don Hubbard, Niels Douglas, Avery Alexander, Colin, Avery Alexander uh, uh, Dr. May, uh, suggested that I would run, and, and that's really how I got involved in running for elective office. What did you go to school after you graduated from Culver? I, I graduated, I went to, uh, I graduated from Culver 61, uh, went to uh, southern New Orleans Okay. Uh, in 65. In fact, I was telling a young lady who escorted me, I also, uh, after 65, uh, took some courses here, okay. post post uh, undergrad courses uh, over here at UNO uh, for a year. Uh, I think I did it because at that time uh, we still had the Army draft. Yeah. And so as long as you were in school, you did not have to go to the wall, you know. That is why I got a PhD. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I had taken a test for the Peace Corps, I had scored high, I was going to go to Senegal. Yeah. And I, I was pretty good in France at that time. Yeah. But then they told me they couldn't protect me from the draft. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I'm not going. So yeah. I stayed in school, mm -hmm. got yeah, my I mean, master's. Yeah. And then they reclassified me. And by chance, your former principal had just been appointed to the draft Back board. Now. And I appealed. And he said, I said, I just got this fabulous fellowship offer at Lehigh. He said, can you prove it? I said, of course. I said, well, I would suggest to the board then that we grant this man his opportunity to go to school. And yeah. he got it. That's he the same thing with me. Yeah, he was the first yeah. black man of the draft board and happened to be on mine. Right. He was, he's the one too. I don't know where I would have wound up, but I stayed in school basically. Because I say I had been involved in civil rights since 1960, yeah. so I had been right. fighting. 
Right. I can help my country by staying here fighting yeah. against racism. Yeah, That's, that was the Dr. Becknell, that was the experience I had too. Yeah. And that's how I, uh, I stayed in school that year. And then uh, they reached, after that, I think they, uh, uh, I got married, ah. which further extended right. my deferment. Uh, you know, I it, remember when I got my doctor, they reclassified me, and I went yeah. down there and said, forget about it, you're too old. We can't yeah, yeah. get you unless there's a national emergency. You're right, you're so, right. Same way. What would have happened to me? I don't know. I don't know either. Uh, I had friends uh, who actually left to go to Canada. Okay. Uh, uh, and of course, I had friends who honored the draft. Yeah. Well, you know, I wasn't yeah. opposed to the war and to that extent. I just felt I had more to do because I had uh, four or five brothers in laws who gone. Yeah. My brother had gone to Korea. I had a brother who had served in World War II. So mm -hmm. I just felt that it was something better I could do with my time. Yeah. And of course, I came back. Well, and, that's, that's true because I think. Uh, uh, you know, and it was in the heart of the civil rights movement. Yeah. And there were other priorities here locally. Yeah. You know. Uh, so you say you had gotten to be director of the? Desire Community Center. Okay. Uh, in, 60, in 1968. Okay. Uh, but before then, I, uh, I was married to a Rutha Haley's sister. To Doris? Doris Jean That's Cassidy. right. I don't know. I remember that story. Yeah, that. It was yeah, uh, another clock girl. Yeah, it, it's uh, Doris and I were married, and I guess it was a result of of that whole civil rights movement and and uh, working with her. Yeah. And Ike Reynolds and Dave the Dennis and Luke Avery. Suarez. Yeah, and Matthew Flucky. Yeah, Suarez. Richard Haley, yeah. Eli, all of those, and we got caught up and uh, we got married. Yeah, you know, and uh, well, I married my secretary. I was president of the youth council. And I married the secretary. <laughs> yeah, uh, Claude Gasper. Claude Gasper who was out here. At married Jalon. I yeah, think that we found out there were eleven NAACP couples who got married. They didn't all stay together. Right. But we same we, way with Doris and I. We, we, we didn't met, all stay together. And eventually got married. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, stayed friends for years. Yeah. Uh, but you true. You're right. You're right. Uh, so was there anything in your high school experience or at Suno that? kind of prepared you for community service? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the whole civil rights, even though it was focused around public accommodations yeah. and things like that. Employment. Employment. And when I got out in 65, it was right after Hurricane Betsy. Yeah. And what happened, I had a degree uh, from Suno, and I went over to uh, the field office for the uh, Tulane School of Social Work and applied for a job. And they gave me a job. They wanted me to sweep down the driveway <laughs> and uh, Duncan Waters, Marina Malden, Frank Bivens, people from the neighborhood. Uh, Objected. They they brought into question uh, uh, why would we send our young people to college and encourage them, and the best you can do is to give them a broom and tell them to sweep down the driveway. So they insisted that there be some parity and equity for his employment. And that's how I got to start working with the uh, too late field unit, uh, Social Welfare Planning Council, because uh, one aspect of the recovery effort after uh, Hurricane Bessie was community organization. Right. They were they wanted neighborhood associations to work for the improvement, and that's actually uh, outside of the civil rights movement how I got involved and started working in Desire. Uh, in fact. I became director of Desire 
community center in 1968, but that was only after uh, we had uh, uh, initiated a drive to have the Houghton Authority to build a community center right after Betsy. And when it was built, uh, I applied for the directorship. There were some great people uh, who were uh, applying to, but they selected me. Uh, I had a good board. I had a professor from UNO. I had Alder McDonald yeah. with, with Liberty Bank. That's, right. Well, he was with International City Bank right. at that time. I see. Me. Yeah, we had neighborhood representative. It, it was an experiment that worked well because it was the center was operated under agreement with the Holland Authority as a community-based nonprofit, uh, which had autonomy for the program. It got it funded for the Holland Authority and from other sources. But however, uh, uh, Reverend Morris, that was, was on the board. Reverend Morris. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Waldo White Sr. Uh, but this board, uh, hired the staff and did the overseeing. And, and I worked them, then I got elected in 70, 71, 72, I don't even remember. Fall of 71. Yeah, and then uh, I uh, got so involved with Baton Rouge that uh, I... Uh, what was that like when you first became a member of the legislature? Because only... Dutch Morial and Dorothy Taylor right. had been there before. Well, as I reflect, you know, it was a, it was a challenging situation for me. I wasn't a lawyer. You were still young. Yeah, and uh, I had been involved with, uh, yeah, I was like 28 at the, at the time. Yeah. I was involved with... I wasn't a member, but I was involved with the Black Panther Party right. uh, and their various programs in the desired community. Uh, I had done all that community organization. And I, I, I found myself thrust in a situation by my own choosing and by the encouraging person that, that became very challenging. You know, uh, in fact, uh, uh, I guess my ignorance in some of the areas kind of stood out because I remember one time challenging uh, a member of the House from Shreveport talking about funding for a Confederate hospital. Yeah. <laughs> but that was the name of the, the name. charity hospital right. up in Shreveport. Right. But, but, but also, it, 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 you know, it... It opened new, well, let me see. There were new doors of not only opportunities, but new doors of challenging, you know, right. to make sure that blacks were involved in all aspects of state government. We began to uh, uh, do a lot of prison reform. We began to do representation on all the state boards that made apps that uh, w were absent of, of any black or minority input. I mean, we had Willie Montgomery. I don't know if you I remember, remember Willie Montgomery. Willie, Willie, well. Yeah, Willie was in horse racing, and and, yeah. and uh, there were no blacks up on the racing commission, and so we we pushed to get him on the racing committee. Uh, we wanted to make sure, like Southern University, prior to the convention of... That's right, because you were delegated to the Constitution Convention, weren't you? Yeah. In fact, that's one of the uh, uh, bright moments, I think, that I cherish in my uh, early political career. Because uh, Southern University was created as a land-grant college, and it only took a mere majority vote of the legislature to change its governance as such. And so when LSU uh, was talking about 
uh, being a flagship university, and uh, they wanted constitutional uh, protection. Right. Uh, I saw it as an opportunity to, to do the same thing for Southern for Southern system, uh, and it worked out because all some of the other state schools did not want LSU. Right. With with, with that because like uh, Southeastern, uh, uh, USL, all those other schools did not want that, uh, so we teamed up. And so we gave constitutional protection to the Southern system. Uh, and that was over and beyond the consent decree right. that, that was imposed <clears throat> at the time. And But uh, we did a strong bill of rights in the Constitution. Probably the strongest in the country. Yeah. Even stronger than the federal. That's right. Strong one. Because uh, they have the updating of the Bill of Rights mm -hmm. as interpreted by the Supreme Court, and they embodied it in our Constitution. Right, right. So I think that's amazing. Yeah, that was, you know, that, you know, uh, the right for, for municipalities to incorporate, right. uh, which. Uh, no longer had to petition the, the state, you could initiate it on your own. Right. Uh, I remember having a, a, a big legislative. For, a flow fight with Shalom Perez from Plaquemine Parish because they did not want the ability for some of those towns in the parish to incorporate, particularly those that had significant uh, uh, minority uh, voters. Same way in Baton Rouge in Scotlandville. Right. In fact, you know, it's ironic. Um, there was an effort in Baton Rouge to uh, incorporate a section outside of Baton Rouge uh, uh, to create a—I I forget the name of the city, but it's it's south of Baton Rouge, right. but it's it's within East Baton Rouge Parish. Well, they're trying to do that now with a separate school system. Yeah, St. George. Yeah, so yeah St. George. That's they were, they that's were trying it. that far back. I didn't remember that. They that they used that provision of the Constitution. Okay. To uh, uh, to uh, to go through the process of incorporation and having uh, uh, its own self governance, as opposed to being a part of the East Baton Rouge Parish government. Hmm. Uh, Did you find any problems of acceptance by the majority of members of the legislature when you first got I there? I think yes. I think you know it used to be. A situation that whenever a black went up to the mic handling legislation, uh, while most of the legislators might have been involved in some other sidebar conversation, somebody would holler, Woo! Which was a signal, pay yeah. attention, see what he's doing, or, right. or see what she's doing. Uh, we had that, but I think. Uh, as the years pass, right. you know, uh, and particularly under the under Governor Edwards, right. because he he Joe Delpit was uh, Speaker Pro Tem. Speaker Pro Tem. Uh, there were Alphonse was chairman of committees, right. and so you know that began to wane right. in terms of of uh, just outright uh, resistance to black legislators. Uh, and I think, you know, I stayed there 14 years. Uh, and and I, I saw, you know, some of the, there obviously was some who would not change. Right, but that was uh, not true of the majority. Yeah, like Thompson, uh, Shady Walls, uh, some of the early Republicans, like yeah. B.F. O'Neill and all the guys from Shreveport. Uh, but I think overall, you know, I saw a transition right. uh, where, uh, and a recognition that as, a, as blacks in the legislature, uh, there needed to be uh, uh, some ground where we could work together on, you know. Whose idea was it from the Legislative Black Caucus? 
I think, you know, Dorothy May, myself, oh. Richard Turnley, Delpit. Yeah. You know, everybody had a caucus. You had the rural caucus. Right. You know, had the Acadian caucus. You know, and we said, hey, look, uh, we have to form this caucus just to have some sort of agenda, right. uh, some consensus on agenda, and to be a force to be reckoned with. At that time, our numbers were small. I think when we first went there, but they were about 12, yeah, 8, about 12, 10 or 12, something like yeah. that. Yeah, numbers were small. So we were, you know, but but sometimes it made a difference, right. particularly on... On a tax uh, vote, it could be very crucial. Yeah, and, and, uh, and because we had the support of the governor. Right. Because uh, he had Joseph. support. Right. That's right. I and mean, a lot of people don't program. remember that he never had a majority of the white vote when he no, won. No, no, no. Uh, and then we had the uh, labor union, right. Victor Busey, and, and which m most of the blacks were, were elected with the help of the labor union. Uh, in fact, they weren't with me at first, but we ultimately uh, shared common uh, initiatives and common philosophy. But uh, we felt that the caucus would be. Who was the first chair of the caucus? I think Dick Turnley. I Dick think, Turnley. I think Dick Turnley. Okay. Yeah, from Baton Rouge. Which is interesting because the majority of members were from New Orleans. Well, yeah, there were. Uh, well, Dick was okay. I like Dick. Yeah, Dick. Yeah, Dick was. Yeah, uh, we c couldn't get the Senate members <laughs> at that time. I tell you. Hank Braden was. Well, Hank wasn't a member then. Well, no, who not was. initially. Sydney was. Sydney was a member of the yeah, caucus. Yeah, yeah, Sydney was Sydney a caucus, was, member of the caucus. Yeah, he was one of the original members. But 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 uh, we had a problem with with, with Hank. Okay. Because he didn't want to be identified as a part of the caucus. Okay. You know, that happened. He, he marched his own drum anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. No, it was yeah. Um, but we had a strong caucus. Uh, what do you think was maybe the most significant thing that the caucus accomplished? Or one of the most significant accomplishments? I think we... I think, my opinion, yeah. I think we, we got the respect of, of other legislators who realized we were forced to be dealt with. Right. I think that uh, we were able to to pass significant legislation, uh, voters uh, a representation legislation, uh, some educational right. legislation because we were caucus right. and because you know we in a, you know there were areas that just as in the constitutional convention that we were able to say you know, to cut a deal. Right. You know, particularly when the deal was in the interest of the folks we were representing. Well, um, you later became a member of the city council. Yeah, and again, it's, it's you know, it, as it was, it was a question of reapportionment again. Yeah. Because as it, and, uh, it was reapportionment that enabled uh, the lines to be drawn to provide for a uh, majority or significant input of black voters in a district. Uh, I was contented to continue my work in Baton Rouge and had talked to M. Tamishi St. Julian yes. uh, about running for the city council. Uh, I had, as a Legislator, I had bought resources to the community. Uh, I had uh, expressed an interest to stay in Baton Rouge. And so when M. Tamisha came to me and said he was thinking about running, I had another faith, enough faith and confidence that he was a conscious brother that, that would, would, I had a theory, I got it borrowed from Jesse Jackson, a parity and equity, okay. that there will always be parity and equity uh, in the district. 
So uh, he agreed, and then he let some folks talk him out of it. Told him he would be a he would be better as a judge because okay. he was a lawyer. Right. And they committed to him. And we, it was some of my friends from Seoul at the time. We were pushing and shoving, and I decided that I had invested too much in the community to have a councilman, because uh, who, who I had heard was going to run really didn't represent at least my personal perspective as uh, had the interest of the community. So I conceded and I ran. Okay. And uh, it was an extensive field. Uh, and uh, I wound up in a uh, runoff. You remember who? Oh Lord, I, it doesn't come. His name, I, I, I don't remember his name right offhand. I said remember because that was my district, District D, right? Huh? You were in District D, weren't you? E. 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 Okay. But what happened? Which that, um, and it was just strange. It was me and the Dwight guy. Uh, he was a water distributor. He okay. had a water company in New Orleans East. Uh, and I never forget, uh, we were at a debate uh, in a runoff, and he said that District E, and he was from uh, the new developing East, you know, should not have a representative with a project mentality. Wow. I mean, he actually said it. And so we taped it. Uh, no, one of the uh, uh, media people had taped it, and we actually we borrowed it. And uh, we used it as a campaign uh, uh, technique we did a commercial around his whole thing about uh, project mentality. Even though I had uh, a degree from Southern University, I had worked with Tulane and all, he just, you know, he used that kind of slang. Right. And so our technique, we said, well, okay, well, let's put a project whipping. Okay. <laughs> which everybody understood at that time, you know, because right. if you were raising a project, you know. Except you, got you hadn't been raising the project. Yeah, you get a project whipping. So, uh, and that's what ultimately happened. We we solidly defeated him. Now, you were a founding member of Dawn? Yeah. I was what, what, what does the acronym stand for? The acronym was for Development Association for Wards and Neighborhoods. Okay. And but I was actually a member of Soul. Okay, I was one of the uh, uh, members that when Soul first started out, we were we spent a lot of energy uh, at that time. Uh, we were electing. We were successful in the election, but we were electing whites. Right. You know, and then. We put together this ticket uh, for the Orleans Parish Democratic Committee, and that's when we started electing blacks. Okay. And so uh, began to uh, uh, in its early seventies. Uh, in fact, they recruited. They were ones who recruited me to run for the House of Representatives, and Teddy Marchand for the House of Representatives in the Lower Lord Lang Nine. War. Right. Uh, and, uh, but at that time, there was this election with Sam, the governor's election was the same Sam time. Sam Bell reigned. Sam Bell, and, yeah. And uh, Bethune. Yeah, Harold Bethune. I think I voted for Bethune. Yeah, Harold, good man. Yeah. Harold, good man. Yeah. Uh, I, I used to listen to him uh, a lot, but he and Sam was running, I think, at the same yeah, time. Yeah, And um, and what happened was that we had all committed to help Sam, 
And then Gildas Long came in on the scene, and we felt at that point, and we were young, at that point, that uh, we needed to make a statement with Sam. We didn't think he could win, right? But we didn't think we ought to make a statement that we're selling him out, right? Particularly after uh, all the energy. And so what happened was that uh, uh, that caused a great division within Seoul. And that's when I broke off and formed Development Association. Okay, see, I didn't know that. Yeah, and and King Wells, Nim yeah, Fong, uh, a group, Thomas Gagne, Nim Fong, a group. I mean, right. together we were strong because right. we had people who were active in the various communities. And so as a result of that, Sam Bell didn't win. I think Sam Bell actually finished behind Bethune. Yeah. And what's his name? Um, Gillis Long didn't win. No. The runoff between that Edwards was Johnston. and Johnston. Uh, and so, you know, and during the elections in the night war, Dawn and, and Seoul, and the, we're a vying organization, you know. Okay. Uh, I think in reflection, many years down the road, it probably was a mistake. Okay. I, 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 I think I told Hubbard that. I said, Hubbard, you know, maybe the way it was handled with the Sam Bell Gillis alone because you had people who were just, and even hubbing them, who had been coming just out of the Civil Rights Movement. Right. And for us to give the impression we were selling out a brother who we all, we didn't say, look, you run, and as a matter of strategy, right. when you get to a point, then we, if there are better opportunities for, for blacks and other minorities, you need to drive right. We hadn't talked about that ahead right. of time. Right. And it was, you know, and I think there were more mature guys, Neil Douglas, Bob Don, Collins, Bob Collins, Lowless, and Lowless. all them. Uh, but after that, uh, in reflection, that probably was the worst thing that could have happened politically, because it had a profound effect upon on uh, electoral process, at least in the night war. Yeah. I mean, if somebody ran for state representative, Dawn would put up somebody. So, so would put up somebody. I mean, it was a waste of energy. And, yeah. and, uh, but it was different parts because uh, yeah. each of them had their own representative. Yeah, right, right. Uh, and then for that went all the way up to city council because when I decided to run for city council after M.T. Mishi, because they had told them to me, she, they could help him be a judge. Yeah. And I said, oh, Lord, they're going to they gonna put up their own candidate. To, yeah, and then I'm, you know, I'm pushing and shoving. So uh, we did that. Uh, I ran and I won. And, but now, I, you ran uh, during, uh, that was after Dutch Mario. Bartholomew had become mayor. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I so, ran during the same time. So you time. served under Bartholomew and Morio, I suspect. Then. No, uh, I just served, you know, he had term limits right. in 94. Okay. See, uh, I served from 86 to 1994. So you didn't serve under Mark? No, I didn't serve. In okay. fact, uh, we were prohibited okay. from serving. I ran, I had to run at large. Okay. And uh, I ran at large. Uh, but I don't, as I recall, there there was there was a four. It was a, the way it was ran. Or the runoff was there were four of us right. for the two seats. Right, Darcy May, Jim Singleton, myself, Ike Spears, maybe five, Peggy Wilson. Yeah. And uh, and that's where we had that big dispute. Right. Because uh, I had really approached Jim them 
and said, look, man, we don't need to do this. You know, I need to just get out because with all of us in the race, you know, uh, Peggy would, would definitely win. Yeah. But Jim said no, you know, that he would rather. So I think ultimately Ike and I, no, there were four. Dorothy didn't make the No, runoff. she didn't make the run off. Right. Uh, Ike and I. And then Jim and Peggy won. Jim and Peggy won. Because they served under uh They Mar. served under Mark. Uh, no, I served under Bartholomew. But you it, were was, there. it was kicks. Like, like, because. Did you support him or did you support Jefferson? I supported Jefferson okay. during that time. Right. Uh, in fact, I used to go to, to, we used to have these forums. And uh, I would, it would be my time. No, uh, like uh, if there was a, 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 a council candidate for D, yes, uh, cool people would be there, and so people would be there with their buttons for the D candidate. And then when I came up, or when it was my time, then they would switch buttons, <laughs> and, <laughs> and and the cool people and the so you know, right? Yeah, and Sidney really wasn't for me. Uh, I mean, he was obligated because he had cut a deal with so that they would mutually support right. each other. Uh, the Lord, in fact, I never forget Dolores Aaron called me crying. Uh, you remember oh, Miss Aaron? Oh, I remember Aaron. Yeah. She was that she had to take my sign down because Sydney was was really making a, a big issue out of okay. it, you know. But uh, but uh, you did support him on the uh, well. That was actually Dorothy the mayor's initiative on well, the Well, I said once he got the mayor, yeah, he was mayor. Well, you know, we yeah. we, we we worked together. Right. Um, uh, in fact, I think it was. You know, sitting there saying, well, hey, that's over with. You right. know, let, let's work together. Right. Um, and for the whole eight years, we worked together. Right. Uh, there were very few times when we disagreed. Right. Uh, but uh, I know we disagreed on the Mardi Gras ordinance. You did? Oh, yeah. Because I was with Darcy. Well, he approved it. Yeah, only after we passed it, but, okay. but the, uh, we... Uh, but he didn't take any public stand against it, I guess, behind no. the scenes. He... Yeah. Okay. And because uh, you recall Lambert and all of them. In fact, uh, I remember that time. I walked out of the meeting. Okay. To, uh, to make them lose a quorum because they were prepared at that point to boil it down. And I told them I couldn't leave Dr. May by herself. Right. You know, and uh, but they had the vote, so I left the meeting, and so they couldn't take a vote, even though they had, they had uh, the majority. They didn't have a quorum, right, to do it. So what eventually brought Lambert around? Uh, community pressure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think community pressure. Yeah. Uh, same way with the human rights ordinance. Yeah. He was not for it. Uh, Jim was not for it, Russo was not for it, and it took us three years to actually pass it. Right. But, um... Well, how was your relationship with uh, Jim Russo? It was good. That's what I thought. It was good. Yeah. It was good. Uh, I had run-ins with his brother. Clarence. Yeah. Before he became judge. Yeah. Uh... When he was chief of police, because he was the chief during the Panther. I remember that. The Panther time. Right. And uh, uh, we had confrontations in our defense, yeah. the community defense of the Panther Party, various programs. And I think that's the most misunderstood uh, situation, political situation that occurred, well, one of them. Uh, because people thought that the Panther Party was in desire to teach us armed revolution. Right. But they actually started a the breakfast, breakfast program, program, which became the forerunner for the school yeah. system to do it. They started the mentoring program. Right. 
uh, after school mentoring program. Uh, they decrease the prevalence of drugs in the community. I mean, the community saw them in very positive light. Well, so apparently much, because they were acquitted. Yeah, and so so much so that that uh, they formed a human circle around the building that the Panthers had occupied to stop the police. I remember I had just come back. I had come back yeah. to write my dissertation. Yeah, uh, it was. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it was a a, uh, a big moment in, in, in my political career. In fact, uh, I, I really, I remember when I was running for state rep, I used to have to get them, I sent my, my children and my wife uptown by my mother-in-law because uh, I was afraid that the police, you know, would uh, do uncanny things, uh, black police and white police. Oh, yeah, police yeah. or police or police. Yeah, and uh, in fact, somebody actually broke into my house, and when the police came to investigate, I mean, they, they had smirks and everything on their face, yeah. like as though they did it, right. or they sent someone to do it. Right. So. Uh, the Panther Party, I guess, provided me protection, so-called protection. Did, they, did their attitudes change towards you once you became a public official? The police? The police? Yeah. Not really. Not really? Not really. Uh, uh, I got to, the, there were a group of police, they created the Urban Squad. I remember Urban Squad. With, with uh, Officer uh, Martin, right. you know, he tried, you know, and so, and then Gus Thomas, of course, worked with us, you know, and I think he was with the NAACP. Yeah, he became president later. Yeah. Uh, you know, the irony of it is that I got snatched off of the porch of the community center right after the, the stalemate. They came back like uh, combat troop, well, what you call them? Uh, special squad. And, Felony and, action squad. Yeah, but they came in and snatched me and another guy off the center porch. Uh, Why, for protection supposedly? Or? Well, that, it was right after the standoff and the people had driven them off and we were on the porch talking about it and it was like, uh, it was like they, they just had to get them out. Yeah. And so they brought a special squad there. I remember mean, Gus saying he, he yeah. drove the bus. Yeah, and, and they had a Catholic police dressed as a priest. I remember. And that. all that. And they snatched me and this guy, Fred O'Neill, who was an I artist. I remember Fred O'Neill. Little small Fred. Yeah. And we were on the porch. But the police who did it was named Raymond Reed. Yeah, I remember Raymond. And uh, Raymond was raised in desire and everything. And ultimately, I mean, there was a bit of feeling I had towards Raymond uh, and Melvin Howard and... Uh, I remember Melvin. Yeah, because they were the ones who were... Uh, well, it was mostly black police that they put out yeah. the front. Oh, yeah. And so, but, you know, irony of it is Raymond, Raymond and I were friends. Yes. Became friends several years later. And uh, he and I went, I was a councilman at that time. We and I went to New Jersey together, uh, to Atlantic City to look at gaming. Gaming had just came that day. It wasn't even here at right. the time. And uh, we, he and I were together. And we came back that Tuesday night and that Wednesday he had a baseball game for his club sponsored team. And he died. 
Hmm. And I'm saying, man, he couldn't have been dead. He just dropped me off. Hmm. Well, really, Wednesday morning, early in the wee hours. Uh, and then Raymond's son uh, lived with me and my wife and my children until he graduated from wow. high school. But, you know, uh, I've had some experiences. You had one that I know who got you. You addressed the NAACP convention. State Convention, 1974, and I remember the speech. Our new day begun. How shall we punk away? Do you remember that? Lord, Doctor, I you had got a huge part of that. How shall we punk away? I never forgot that. That was one of the best speeches wow. where you raise the question: Do we use a comma, mm. a question mark, mm. a colon, or a period? And you went through the possibilities yeah. of whether we had really begun. And it's one of the most powerful speeches I heard. I've never forgot that for sure 40 years. I sure wish you could share a copy with me. I well, tell you what, I tell my wife that's the only thing that uh, I regret now. And so I'm glad to do this interview uh, because uh, I've forgotten a lot yeah. of things. Well, what, what yeah. would you say about the future of the city? What, what do you think about the future? Are you hopeful? Do uh, you think there's I been think some progress? I think we have a lot of issues. I am not as confident in terms of some, not all, yeah. of the black elected officials. I think they have gotten to where they've gotten on the backs and shoulders of not not just us, but yeah. people before us yeah. who was involved in the civil rights movement, who've yeah. been consistent, the Llewellyn Soniad, yeah. the Novi Soniad, I mean, the Daniel Burge, yeah. and, and all those people. Sapatel. Yeah, the, the art, yeah, both senior yeah. and junior. Uh, and it's like they have no remembrance of them or at worst. Don't have any knowledge of it. Yeah, well, and even worse, even those who do it, it's like, well, it's my time. Yeah. You know, and and so I am not as optimistic. Yeah. I was talking with a former councilman just the other day and said, man, you know, we have swapped some black faces why? Because it was our time. Yeah. But I I have some serious reservation just based on my experience with some of them now. Yeah. You know, I don't hardly <coughs> ever see them. I understand they grew up in different era, eras. I don't see them. I don't hear them forthright speaking out. Yeah. I think they're more tied up in issues that are important but doesn't reflect the priorities of our community. community. Yeah. That's right. You know? But again, the, your generation, yeah. like Muriel, even Ashley, this was an extension of the civil rights movement. Right. Not now. These are professional politicians. Oh, man, they are so too professional. Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, and some of them I respect, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, I think I, well, I, you know, I don't have, I won't call names the ones I don't respect, <laughs> but I do respect James Gray because I think he's trying. Okay. I think he's actually trying. Uh, I think with all the adversities that happen with some black elected officials going yeah. to jail. Yeah. Unfortunately. Uh, it left a bad taste yeah. in the black communities. Yeah. And I think uh, that added to uh, to the rise of some of those who who figure, well, you know, uh, I'm the best answer. But again, yeah. you look at your generation, yeah. who obviously was scrutinized yeah. much more. 
You didn't have those scandals. I mentioned right. the, 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 the worst thing I could say about Judge Mario was that yeah. he was uppity. Yeah. But nobody ever accused him of being dishonest. That's right. But That's it, right. For that generation, this was an extension of the voter registration drives That's to true. get people involved. Now we have a lot of young professional politicians who are there. In like fact, politicians. you know, I was telling somebody, you know, and I was thinking about going back and talking to Hubbard about reforming so with some new initiatives. One would be voter registration. Yeah. You never, I mean, voter registration was a key element of the emerging black politics. Right. I mean, we did it. Secondly, when I think about where we're going as a city, I have this theory that while I constantly hear we represent the majority and everything, uh, I wonder how true the numbers are. Uh, it may be in terms of population, may not be in terms of registration, particularly with what happened after Katrina. Yeah. I give you an example. My <clears throat> kids were in McKinney, Texas, for 11 years, and they're adults. And the whole 11 years, they stayed on the voter registration. Mm. I was coming back and forth because I never changed my right. residency. I kept my driver's license. I paid my property tax and everything. But when I would go to vote, I said, my son's, my daughter's name. Say yeah, and I think that's true yeah. a lot. Now you don't like to hear the question about purging because in the early days, right. to validate the roads and for other right. crazy kinds of motives, there were pur purges right. just to eliminate the impact right. of the bag vote. But I think, but if it keeps people on the registration list when you redistrict, that's, that's when right. it becomes crucial. My mother died in two thousand four, and I know she was still quote-unquote, registered in 2008. I haven't checked since. That's right. And I think that's true. So when I look at the city, I, I, I got to mellow whatever I say with understanding what the true numbers are. And then, but me and my friend talked, and we said, man, we're guilty of electing people who we call friends. Right. You know, and so I... So, because they are our skin yeah. folks, yeah. they're and not necessarily our kin folks. That's right. And uh, so, I uh, I think there will be sufficient money to do stuff. There will be official, uh, unspent FEMA money to do things. But the question is where it goes. You know, that I commend the mayor for media addressing the sinkhole on Canal Street. Yeah. I don't fault him, that's his priority. Yeah. But I just fought the members of the council. It's the man. The district Have councilmen been, control the money, don't they, over the streets in their district? At least that's what Dutch Morgan yeah, told me. Yeah, they do. Okay. But there aren't any street monies. Okay. Well, you know what they are. Yeah. But they, yeah, yeah. But it, it ain't significant, but it is. And where they decide to put it at is, uh, I mean, you, you think that's a good idea? To have it uh, pass it out among district councilmen instead of having somebody set priorities based upon need? Well, being a district councilman, <laughs> yeah, I, know. I, I would want it. Because you had yeah, to answer yeah. to your constituents. Yeah, yeah. And so, <laughs> but the point is, that, uh, well, I don't fault the mayor for fixing the thing yeah, no, that's but, but he ought to come down to Desire yeah. and see the overgrown weeds. I can't walk a block yeah. from one corner to the another corner on the sidewalk yeah. for overgrown weeds, overgrown lots. Well, why would the district property. council be concerned about that? Yeah, I, and, and I'm occurring these words. I've said to the council, and I've said even to my friend Gray, who I think is trying to do, that uh, we have historic preservation in all of the inner cities, neighborhoods, but it's historic preservation of the involuntary kind. Mm -hmm. In other words, 
Yes, my daughter said, this house and this blighted property was there before Katrina. Yep. Don't blame it on Katrina. Some of them were there since Betsy. That's I know, right. I know all nice boys. And, and I said, you know, they have to change their focus. You know, they can fight about the trademark building at the end of Canal Street. They can fight about the crossover at Audubon Park. Man, but, 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 but show some due diligence in trying to improve and get rid of this historic preservation of the involuntary kind of our neighborhood. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, streets, blighted property. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, just basic city services are absent in our neighborhood. And you yeah. can go, you can go, in any part of the summer, you know, like Gurytown, yeah. you know, man, I, I can go show you where I scratched on the wall of the house. Well, that was one of the jokes there in the first yeah. Iraq war, that <laughs> the bombers <laughs> would come over and yeah. they would miss, oh, we hit this already. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking, well, it's so devastated, somebody must have hit it before we got here. Yeah. Uh, and Got one more question and yeah. then we have to okay. wrap up. You are in semi-retirement now. I say semi because I'm sure as a former counselor and people still contact you to yeah, do I mean, things. Yeah, and I try to contact, I, you know, one thing among councilmen, the elected officials, you know, they is that way, okay, well, yeah, you know, I'll return your call. Right. Uh, well, what is it you need help? No, 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 it's like, well, you know, uh, in fact, I've had one of them to say, you know, uh, I'm trying to bring some urgent matters to him. Well, email me. Yeah. You know, you want to accept a phone call. Wow. Email me. Mm. And I'm saying, man, look, all I want to do is talk to you about parity and equity. Right. Do what you got to do, because I know there are some neighborhoods and constituents uh, who don't need much, but you got to deal with them in terms of responding to them. But you got to have some equity in terms of how you apply limited resources. Right. You know, one thing about us that I like to feel, that when we were on a city council or in the legislature, there was, no, there was never a question about who black people could come to to talk to about an issue. Right. And it yeah, wasn't just your, your district, you know, it yeah. was, didn't matter where they lived. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But now he, you wonder who speaks for the forgotten communities, who speaks. And they can come up with a list of things they're working on that sounds good, sounds progressive. But doesn't mean, to me, doesn't mean shit. It's money when, that somebody when, else When you putting, don't change. Yeah. Uh, the situation in our communities, and I know we have to hold with some our communities responsible, and people, you know, for some of the things that that occur. But man, you know, uh, I never did fault Peggy Wilson because she took care. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Clarkson. Yeah, of Clarkson Clarkson. was yeah. everywhere. Yeah. So why don't you? understand why you know why do you even when you do you feel as though you're apologetic yeah. or that if you do one thing well that ought to satisfy I mean you let me go on. Yeah. and so hopefully I I think uh, there are opportunities coming up I've even thought about getting back in the race myself yeah. uh, but uh, I'm dealing with health challenges, so I can't do that now. Okay. But uh, I will continue uh, to do whatever I can. Thank you very much. Yeah. I enjoyed Thank you, it. Brother. And yeah. I learned. Yeah.